Hey, there we go. Let's see what we can do. I got my reading lesson. Maybe I might not need it. As you know, Breaker Brown Book Club is doing this. Ta da! Uh, Todd G. Hamilton, uh, Immigration and Remaking of Black America. So I've been reading out of this, but, you know, it's like an academic book. No, don't get me wrong, I, I can do academic books. But, you know, I'm going like that. But the problem is this. Of course, I'm at JB's house. You got a lot of books here. Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing the Baldwin thing. You know, uh, this is a, a, a collected essay. It's James Baldwin, Notes of a Native Son. Nobody knows my name. The fire next time. Uh, no name in the streets. The devil finds work and other essays, right? And remember, it's put out by the, uh, what is the, uh, uh, the Library of America. That means that it doesn't go out of print. You know, it's like, like beyond classic, you know, American classic. It's American classic. Okay. So anyway, I've been reading from this book, right? Let me read you something from this. So what I mean now, now I had already had my uh, my pills this morning, you know, my blood pressure, whatever, to take my pills, but I, I digest some, some uh, calcium, but when you take the calcium, I take with the with the vitamin D, right? And uh, I made a smoothie. Oh, wait a second, before I get to, let me tell you what's in the smoothie. Okay, I had the, the mango chunks, right? And then I had blueberry chunks, right? Uh, and then I put, uh, and then I got, uh, what, oh, let me tell you what the, the wait a second. I've been drinking it. I put it. In. Goat's milk yogurt. That's what I use, right? And then I had the uh, had the leftover of some stuff. Um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, the blueberry juice, cranberry juice. So I put that in there, and then of course I put my um, what do you call that? Uh, the vitamin C, buffered vitamin C. Now, buffered vitamin C because it has the magnesium and I guess the potassium. It's easier on your stomach, supposedly. Well, it's powdered, right? And of course, I put my moringa powder in there. Love me my moringa, right? And of course, turmeric. Turmeric in there. And because it's like a bitter taste, I put some maple syrup in there. I don't really, well, I put some maple syrup in there. And then I poured it, hold that, made a big thing. And I poured it in the, in the, the leftover bottle. Well, the bottle from the the uh, cranberry blueberry juice, you know, it's in that bottle being stored in there while I drink out of this. All right? See? Okay. So that's what I'm because I'm, I'm healthy, I'm trying to be healthy, strong, wise. Okay. So let me just read from this because this 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 is kind of interesting. This is a uh, uh, bourbon, as we said. Let me read this uh this little passage here. Uh. Okay, here we go. The new prosperity caused many people to pack their bags and go. Some blacks got as far as Queens, Jamaica, or the Bronx. The Bronx, my hometown. Yeah, we're talking, you know, Mount Haven section, pads and housing projects. It's funny, uh, Baldwin get away with it. He says, Queens, Jamaica, Queens, my family. It, we say it's Jamaica Queens, you know, because it's not Jamaica, it's Jamaica Queens, all right? Like the, take it from a Bronx boy, all right? <laughs> That's how it's been out, right? But hey, but boy, let's do whatever he wants, okay? One might say that a certain rup uh, rupture began during this time. Uh, I guess with time period, we talk about like the early 60s, 50s, 60s, right? Uh, we began to lose each other. The whites who left moved directly into the American Main Street. And we like to, and, and as we like to say, without the complexity of the smallest regret and without a backward look, the blacks moved into limbo. The doors opened for white people and especially for their children. The schools, the unions, industry, and the arts were not open for blacks. Not then and not now. This meant, means that the black family had moved onto yet another sec excuse me, onto yet another sector in a vast and endless battlefield. The people I am speaking of come mainly from the south. They had been driven north by the sheer impossibility of remaining in the south. You know, we're talking about the lynchings and the blah blah blah. You know what I'm talking about. Death is what we're talking about. They came with nothing, and the good and the good Lord knows it was a hard journey. 
Their children had never seen the South. Their challenges came from the hard pavements of a hostile city, and their parents had no arms with which to protect them from its devastation. That's a good turn of, of, of words there, uh, uh, James. You know, Bowman said, like, no arms to protect them. No arms to protect them. You got it? Bowman's brilliant. Come on now. But let, I'm not saying that, that Mr. Hamilton's not brilliant, but let's go to what, let's, let's just jump to Mr. Hamilton. So we're talking basically, let's say 19, pre, pre-1965 reality is what um, Baldwin's talking about here. Let's go post-1965 reality in the, in the reading assignment that we got from, uh, you know, from who we got it from. Uh, where we got here? Uh, let's see. Let me find this. Final thoughts. What am I looking for here? Oh, here. Let me look here. Here we go. Although research suggests that both black immigrants and black Americans suffer from contemporary forms of discrimination, with some evidence that black Americans experience a higher, higher levels of discrimination. Okay. The legacy of prior discrimination policies is reflected more acutely in the outcomes of black Americans. Many black Americans continue to live a highly segregated will continue to live in highly segregated neighborhoods and another uh, under and underperforming schools. Factors that are major hurdles in assessing um, good jobs, developing skills, and maintaining good health. That's Health, okay, that's very well. We won't, you know what I'm talking about. Although many black immigrants hail from countries ranking poorly or measured of uh, poorly on measures of social well being, these social factors are not fully reflected in the outcomes of selected groups of migrants. Okay, for example, the mean level of education in Nigeria, the country sending the most African immigrants to the United States. To the United States was six years in 19, rather than 2015, right? Nigerian immigrants in the United States, however, have 15 mean years of schooling, more than twice that of the population of their origin country. I let that sing in, it's an academic kind of thinking, so I'll, let you, I'll give you time to sing in, right? This discrepancy um, in education suggests that first generation Nigerian immigrants residing in the United States disproportionately represent the upper social classes of, impov of an impoverished nation. You know, the people that make it through, it's a different kind of middle passage, okay? Uh, where the 53.5% of the residents li uh, uh, lived on less than $2 a day in 2014. Don't worry about that. The important thing, but let me just say something here, because they, they, when, you, when you're reading this, they constantly say, and they constantly say, you know, although research suggests that black uh, black um, uh, immigrants and black Americans, black Americans, when they talk about black Americans pre-1965, they're talking ADOS, lineage, okay, ADOS, not just black Americans, anybody can be black, but ADOS, that lineage, American descendants of slavery, that's what they're talking about here, and that's what's important. So you got it, pre-1965 with an ADOS man? Speaking directly for ADOS, and uh, I don't know the the the, the, the lineage of uh, Todd Hamilton or, or Douglas or forward by Douglas Massey. I don't know their lineage, but they're speaking after 1965, and therein lies the rub. So I let all that sink in while I drink my fine concoction here. Y'all take care. See you soon. All right. <laughs>